I built this bed. But this is not your average bed. I built quite a few special features into it that you probably haven't seen before. It's all solid hardwood weighing over 250 kilograms in a floating design, which means you can't see the legs except you really want to. There's a special decorative inlay all around the sides and the push to open drawers in the nightstands, which are nicely integrated in the frame. Custom dimmable LED light panels with touch control and I still can reach the outlets and light switch behind it. Decorative cushions on the headboard and I didn't even show you the highlight feature yet. This was a hell of a project, constantly maxing out my workshop with its size and weight. It produced 15 bags of shavings, I even had to refill my glue bottle three times. What a journey. But now, back to the beginning. Building a bed frame is simple. Four boards, four legs, a couple screws and done. But terrible video potential. So we need to add some design and some fancy material to make it interesting and a lot more complicated. My fancy material is this. Two logs, one apple wood, one pear. I got them from a friend who had them for a couple decades already. They are perfectly dry and ready to use. One of the first steps when working with raw lumber like this is getting the surfaces flat, parallel and to a consistent thickness. And I have a machine for that. It's a jointer planar combination machine which makes pieces flat on top and to thickness on the bottom. But if you keep close attention, you can see the slight scale issue here. But fortunately there is another and more labor intensive way with a router and a jig. To set it up we had to remove the logs again which took us an hour to set up for a <laughs> 10 second scene. The jig then consists of two beams, two rails and a slide on top with the router. The base beams get leveled out with the string method to form a flat plane where the workpieces rest and the rails get mounted equal distance to the beams to create a parallel plane. If you wonder how and why this is working, check out my building video of the jig. I made a significant upgrade to the jig cause you're using it from the front here, moving the router to do your passes and after each pass move over the whole sled for the next pass. But doing that is a bit difficult cause it's heavy and if you push at the wrong spot it kinda jams up and doesn't want to move. So I made and installed a gear rack along both rails and mounted a pair of gears to the sled. With this now I have a better control over how far I want to move the sled and because both gear racks are connected with this rod it doesn't matter where I push on the sled to move it fast it can't get skewed anymore and won't end up binding. The workhorse is this 60 mm flattening bit with rounded carbide inserts sponsored by Freiser. It's a beast, so time for the first slab. Unfortunately, it's badly cupped and twisted and I need to cut it in half. Near the end of this cut, the blade can get pinched and the saw kicks back. I anticipated that, however, grabbed the saw with both hands and was still under control. Now the slabs can go on the jig with a spacer and wedges to adjust the height. The slabs are also twisted and I try to even that out with some more wedges. Then I put the sled on top and check the heights. I moved to one end of the slab, made this measuring wedge with which I can check the gap between the sled and the high spot and the low spot. The high spot is about five and the low spot at about eight. On the other side, the high spot is at about five and the low spot at about 10. The numbers on here aren't millimeters or anything, it's just a relative scale that helps me get both ends relatively equal to each other, cause then I get the most out of the slab. And as it is now, I think that's good enough. Then I move to the highest spot on the slab and plunge the bit to the surface. Here's the best feature of this router base, because after it's locked I can still adjust the depth with this here. And this is how I set my depth of cut. Okay, here the result after the first pass. I removed a little bit of material on the high spot on this end and on this end, which is good. That means the twist gets cut away. And I also removed a lot already in the middle. And that means this slab also has a bow to it. And the second pass. 
You wouldn't believe how much comfort this gear rack added to the jig. It's amazing. Second pass done and more of the twist got removed. This is what I call inkjet printer mode. That was 15 more minutes, now the first side is done. For the second side I put two equally thick spacers under the slab so it rests parallel in the jig and inkjet printer mode can machine it. This first board is now flat on both sides and has a consistent thickness of about 46 millimeters. And that's excellent because the target depth of the final board is 40 millimeters, so I still have room to work with. Also pretty cool, this flattening bit cuts nice long shavings, much easier to deal with than dust. I'm running it at 15,000 RPM, which is faster than recommended, but it's rated up to 18,000, so this should be fine. And it creates more cooling air for the router because this uses all the power. Eventually I got all the boards nice and flat and you can tell because stacked on top like they are now you can hardly see any visible gaps in between them and nothing's rocking which is optimal because in the next step the saw track goes on again and I can make another precise straight cut. The other reason is to cut away some cracked parts and then I render slabs through the table saw to remove the bark. My target width for the boards is 30 centimeters and that's obviously not possible. So I'm gluing a strip in between the boards that I could actually make from the off cuts that came from ripping. I just had to glue a couple pieces together. Adding biscuits will make my life a lot easier when gluing. They will align the three strips and prevent them from shifting. That's what I like to see. Glue squeezing out all the way. That means this joint is closed and tight. And then I did it again and again. While that's drying, I could start with the headboard. The material for that is even bigger and heavier, about 44 kilos per slab or two thirds of me in wood. These slabs are so badly twisted that cutting through the middle wouldn't be enough. So I first cut them in half lengthwise and then down the middle and even further to a size that fits on the jointer which is a lot faster than with the flattening jig. With one face and edge straight the pieces go together again with a couple biscuits, glue and clamps. I repeated that 12 times and almost ran out of clamps. Well at least the ones with a red handle. The next day I scraped off the glue and straightened the edges for gluing it into a big board again. These parts all came from the same board and that's how I want to glue them back together. So end to end here and then together in the middle. But the big leverage could make this relatively small glue joint in the middle fail. So I cut one of the boards in half again, offset everything and then it's fine. A dry assembly went pretty well. I used two ratchet straps to pull the ends together and with a bunch of biscuits in between all the joints the parts kind of align each other and it ends up pretty straight. There's about a one millimeter gap when I put on a straight edge and over a length of about two meters. That's not too bad. And then with glue. It's glued together now and went almost flawless. Only here at the end grain joint there isn't much glue squeeze out. But that doesn't matter. It won't fall apart because of that. And then again and again. And now I need to glue the three parts together. Similar to before I straightened the edges added biscuits and prepared to glue on the flattening jig that I covered in packing tape to prevent the glue from sticking. Key for this huge glue up to be successful is preparation. Every clamp and ratchet strap is in position and I've done two dry assemblies to avoid possible problems. And that's definitely worth it because this glue up is too expensive to fail. I maxed out all clamps and straps but I can't be sure that all the gaps are fully closed. This piece is now just too heavy to pick up and I couldn't really change anything. So whatever state it has when the glue is dry, I'll take it from there. There at least is undeniably glue squeeze out. The next day I got it out of the clamps, assembled the jig again and began flattening. At first not much is happening as I remove the high spots, but then it goes rather quickly. This is the result after a few passes and it's very satisfying seeing this random surface transform into the flat pattern, especially in the time lapse from above. I also spent some time getting the router more perpendicular in the jig, so now the lines between the passes are almost flush 
They were quite noticeable before and this will save me a lot of standing time later. The 1.5mm deep cuts with about 80% side step over made good progress and were at the power limit of the 1600W router where it didn't get too hot. I haven't reached all spots yet and this piece is too long for the jig so here it's untouched. But that's okay because this is the backside against the wall and it's flat enough already to flip around and work on the front side. Because of the way I glued it up, this side is pretty flat already and all I'm doing now is remove a little bit of material until everything is flat and even. Which means printer mode again. And then we shifted the piece to reach the overhanging spot. Alright, that went well and now the front side is complete. Flipped around again, I then cut to final thickness. Alright, now I'm at my target thickness of 40 millimeters. I couldn't reach all the spots because the raw material wasn't quite thick enough everywhere. I could deal with that by reducing the thickness a little more or fill it up with epoxy. But honestly, I don't care. This is on the backside, nobody will see it. Let's move on. And moving on means cutting the side pieces to thickness, but that's more or less the same again. Altogether, this did a fantastic job flattening, leaving a beautiful surface finish and going as fast as possible, the limiting factor being the power my router could offer. All the cutters are still sharp, that's pretty cool. So if you're interested in one of these or its little brother, this also comes with the rounded inserts, I just don't have them. There's a link in the video description and if you buy one through my link, you will support me at the same time because Freiser gives me a small percentage of that purchase and you can save 10% as well with my coupon code MARIUS10. It's pretty cool, so if you need one of these, give them a try. The coarse grid sanding I did right after cleaning up because that's easiest done now, so scribbling lines and sanding them away. The machining marks were almost flush, so this didn't take too long. Now all this are just the decorative wooden parts. They're not complete, but before focusing on details, I need to make the structural parts. And believe it or not, I don't have enough wood for that, so let's go get some. I picked up some beech wood, the cheapest hardwood where I live. And I cut it down into pieces I needed. The shorter pieces I could do with a jointer and planer. The longer pieces I put onto the flattening jig, which was still set up at that time. Here are all pieces in rough length and position. I'm gonna start with the main frame. And for the joinery, I'll be using a pretty cool tool that I haven't used in a while, the Pancho router. This is a contraption that holds and moves a router horizontally with the workpiece sitting on this table. It's guided by a template up here and copies the shape of the template into the workpiece. Then switching to the outside of the template, I can cut the matching shape into the second piece. And then they fit together perfectly. However, this size joint isn't enough for the bed frame, so I made a custom template that will cut a bigger double mortise and tenon joint. This is the result with this custom template, and this is much better. To set this template up and make everything work, I marked the joint center on a scrap piece, lined that up with a center mark on the table, installed a random bit that comes to a point, and the follower pin is in a center hole I made in the template. When I now bring this whole thing forward, the point of the bit needs to end up in the joint center. And I can adjust the left to right position by just sliding the template left and right in the holder and up and down by sliding the whole holder up and down. I cut the frame pieces to length, marked the positions of the joints, put them on the panther router, lined them up with the center mark and cut the mortises. The joints are also on the ends where the mortises come through. The matching tenons get cut with the outside of the template. All joints fit, it's a pretty tight assembly so I won't glue that, that would be challenging. 
and a glued together frame would also be too big and heavy to move. Instead, I'll be using washerhead screws to fasten each joint. They will pull them together properly and allow me to break it down into smaller sections. Next now comes this middle rail. It needs to be sunken down a little bit, so this surface and this surface end up at the same height. I marked four dados in the center and began with the router when it suddenly stopped working and refused to continue without new brushes. So I did the obvious, ignored the problem and continued with a different router. I'm sure I won't regret that in the future. Past me, you're an idiot. Then I transferred the dado position to the middle rail, cut them as well and fastened the rail with screws through the dado center. Finally, I checked for square by measuring the diagonals and locked that in place with two cross braces. The structural frame is now complete. It will later hold the slatted frames for the mattresses and the heavy decorative frame around it. But before that, I'll add the leg parts to raise it off the floor. The legs have angled pieces at 65 degrees and I roughly set that on my table saw to cut a template for later. At the same angle, I cut the two lower leg parts to length and the actual leg parts. Two of these parts form a leg and will sandwich this one and in order for this to work, I need to remove the material here. I do that with a series of cuts on the table saw. To set the fence for the pieces that are angled the other way, I use the template from before. The little leftover at the ends I removed by hand, which is safer than trying to balance on the small middle section. These parts now connect the lower part from the feet and a stretcher from the main frame. And I'll first glue them together like this and then custom fit the second part that goes on top of here. Make sure there is no more gap and that way the glue ups are also less stressful. After the glue dried, I trimmed the pieces, removed glue squeeze out and reassembled the frame. The frame now is strong enough so that I can walk basically on any part of it without it moving or creaking or whatever. That's pretty cool. Except for the rear end, there it can still lift up. But that will change when I add the heavy headboard, sides and footboard. I'm starting with the footboard and need to cut this to the exact length of the frame's width. So it's flush on this and the other side. It gets mounted to the lower edge of the frame with a bunch of screws. The holes for that I drilled before the frame assembly and can now use them to transfer their locations to the footboard and drill pilot holes there. It's the same for the sides, but here I cut a tenon to one end for the corner joint. The corners will be a big roundover made as a separate piece and it will be glued to the tenon of the sides and the footboard will bolt into that. The material for that is just another offcut from before. I start with a cutout for the bolt that needs to be this shape. It only requires a hole, a slot with a router and some chisel work. I drop the bolt in place, slide it forward, tighten it with a ratchet wrench and in the end it's invisible from the outside. With a threaded insert in the corner piece I can now bolt this together. On the side pieces this insert now interferes a little bit with the mortise and tenon joint. So I will shorten the tenon behind the insert and the mortise will then start from there. I made the mortise with a series of cuts on the router table and flipped it around every time to get it centered. I had one oopsie where I cut too much material away here, one of the most visible spots in the end. So I glued a random piece back on there to trim flush again. I don't think you will notice it in the end. Making the bolts and the mortise and tenon joint for the corners were basically straightforward and easy. The actual challenge with these parts is the large roundover. I could buy a big roundover bit or make some kind of jig to do that with the saw or the router. But doing any of that would take longer than just doing it manually with hand tools. And that's what I did. And as a bonus, I got this pretty cool time lapse.
Nice. I find it fascinating how compared to no corner, the simple round over changes the whole appearance of the frame. Then the heavy challenge, the headboard. For now, I only need to cut it to final dimensions and mount it to the rest. The headboard gets screwed into the frame like the other pieces, but then there are also three of the washer head screws into the side on both sides, which is definitely strong enough to hold the weight. It also won't be mounted flush to the frame, slightly below it, so I made these brackets that will hold it at the right offset. Functionally, the bed is complete. Now come comfort, design and special features, which are five mini projects on their own. Fully integrated nightstands with a drawer, decorative cushions on the headboard, an infill with dark gravel around the frame, custom light panels and two hidden drawers. And then of course, rounding over everything, sanding, finishing, the usual stuff. Why the hell am I doing all that? Let's start with the nightstands. No explanation necessary, just watch. Top board and round corner go here and the sideboard here. Then it's flush on the top here and on the side here. For perpendicular screw holes, I made a jig from an offcut that has a perpendicular hole through it for guiding the drill bit and a bit of a relief cut on the backside for the wood chips. For the drawers, I'll be using undermount drawer slides and making a box for them is extremely simple. The length is the length of the slide minus 10 millimeters plus the material thickness. The width is the width of the opening minus 45 millimeters and a groove for the bottom panel 12 millimeters from the lower edge. That's it, screw it together and it's done. The clips that come with the slide get screwed into the front and with a hole in the back, the slide can hook and clip into place. The slides are pushed to open, so the drawer fronts are inset in the opening and the slides need to be inset by the thickness of the front plus the thickness of the box material plus about six millimeters because that's the travel of the push to open mechanism. I space out the front with a few washers, screw it on and then the drawers are complete. Next is lighting. We didn't want to have typical bedside lamps, but instead a clean look with in the headboard integrated dimmable light panels. But the ones in the right size are difficult to find or very expensive. So I tried making that myself and noticed this is really easy. A wooden and aluminum frame, a piece of frosted plexiglass and LED strips glued to the back panel. That's it. You can see the individual light dots, but I don't mind that. The problem is the light switch. The one that came with the LED strip isn't aesthetic. Mounting it here with the cords would look terrible, but I think I found a super cool solution. There are readily available touch dimming switches with a metal body. And so I thought, why not just use the aluminum frame as the metal body? So I open it up, build it into my prototype panel and it works. Isn't this amazing? Now let's build the real ones. Since you can see the LEDs, I glued them on accurately and made sure I have minimal overlapping cables when soldering, which work pretty well. The sides are made with strips of plywood and white coated MDF backboard glued together. A small cutout in the plywood creates a slot for the aluminum T profile. The small lights are simple rectangles. The big lights have because I seem to hate myself, a 45 degree corner in them. So cutting miters for the small frame was straightforward. For the big frame, I had to custom size every piece and change the angle setting on the jig. It wasn't too bad, just took a bit longer. Before gluing, all frames got some tapped holes to secure the aluminum later. The small frames are easy enough with rubber bands. 
the big ones I glued every corner individually with tape and a square. This last bit has a cutout for the little circuit board, the power plug and room for the cable to the aluminum frame for the touch connection. The other side where I have to do a little wiring is exactly where I didn't put any LEDs so they don't interfere. Then some more soldering from the circuit to the LEDs, from the power plug to the circuit and... There it works! The small panel gets connected to the same output and they always turn on and off together. The aluminum frame I cut to rough size with the bandsaw and then precisely with the table saw and jig. I time consumingly had to tweak every piece individually, but that was worth it because there are no gaps in the corners. They get secured with tiny set screws through the tapped holes. Alright, the next challenging part is the electrical connection between the circuit board and the aluminum frame, cause soldering to aluminum sucks. I don't have special solder, but a non-ideal solution that works. I drill a tiny hole into the edge of the T-profile and another one across it. There I can insert a wire, heat it up real good and spread a blob of solder over it, which then creates kind of a mechanical lock. A test I made was stronger than the wire itself. I think that's enough for the no load application. And the electrical connection is also sufficient. First try. And it doesn't work. Huh. Let's test the other one. Doesn't work. <sighs> it does work when this frame part isn't touching any of the other and is insulated. So the entire frame is probably too much metal body. I'm not entirely sure how the circuit works, but I guess through grounding it or creating a potential difference when touching, and with a bigger metal body, that potential difference is probably not high enough to trigger the circuit. But the solution is simple. I shortened this piece of the frame, 3D printed some tiny pieces of T-profile, put them in the gaps for insulation, and now it works. This now of course is the only touch sensitive surface, but this is still big enough. The last part missing is the frosted glass. Again, simple for the small panels and complicated for the big ones. This stuff is super brittle, so to cut the hole at a precise location, I made a template with wood and used it with a flush trim bit to copy the shape. I need some way of holding the frosted glass up, so I 3D printed these thin springs that I can tape to the inside wall. The glass sits on them and is clamped and secured with the aluminum frame. The lights are now complete and to install them I need holes in the size of them in the headboard. But these holes will create a thin section in the headboard that I'm afraid it's breaking during transport, so I'm reinforcing that with steel flat stock. Then I precisely mark the position of the lights, clamp on edge guides to cut the perimeter, remove the bulk of the material with the jigsaw and finish the holes with a big flush trim bit. The corners get chiseled square and then the panels fit. Oh yeah. All light panels are in place and fit, a big relief, but the wiring also needs to go somewhere. And to manage that, I cut some more cable channels on the back side. I temporarily hooked up the 12 volt power supply. Unfortunately, I can only test it upside down like this, but it works. And thanks to video editing, I can also show you a clip from the future where it's installed properly. Nice. Now come the decorative cushions that'll go here. They're made with an MDF backboard in a parallelogram and triangle shape and every single one gets two holes drilled for mounting later. Then I laid out the pattern, positioned them precisely and transferred the hole centers with the same force in a bit. I cut the foam to the same shape with the bandsaw. It's pretty cool how well this cuts. With another template, I cut the fabric to size and my mom trimmed the edges. 
Then I put the foam and backboard on, compressed it evenly with spacers and a rail and stapled the fabric in place. The corners were a bit of folding fiddling, but worked. At least for the parallelograms. For the triangles, my mom sewed the pointy bit before we put the foam and backboard into it. The rest could be stapled again. But we did four tests before getting consistent results. In the end, that was worth the practice. And here are all of them. For a secure and invisible installation, I have the two holes in all of them and made a 3D printed clip where it can just snap on. Awesome, that all worked. The alignment isn't spot on yet, but I made the holes in the clips oversized so I can adjust the final position in the end. But for now, I have to take everything apart again because next for the decorative gravel inlays, I need big dados in the sideboards and I'll cut them with the flattening bit little brother. Unfortunately, the big router still isn't working again and this one isn't quite powerful enough for the task. A different router. I'm sure I won't regret that in the future. Past me, you're an idiot. Now I have to repair this one first. Or I could use this router and ignore the problem again. That's a smart idea. Cutting the dados is straightforward with many passes and using the workpiece edge and a fence on the router as a guide. At my target depth, I then taped the nearby surfaces with packing tape and closed off the open ends with a small piece. I placed all pieces outside and roughly level for the pour, which is a mixture of gravel and epoxy. Usually this stuff is used for flooring. The epoxy comes in a bag with two compartments that you can use for mixing. Unfortunately, one side was broken and leaked out, so I had to pour all of it into another bucket to mix there. Quite a mess. That's not how it is supposed to go. <laughs> but then it could be added to the gravel and my dad mixed it. Little by little, with a small children's shovel actually, I poured it into the dados and evened it out with a trowel. While my dad was constantly mixing the rest to prevent the epoxy from running to the ground. All in all, this was relatively easy to work with, but the smallest amount I could buy was more than what I needed, so I put the rest into two molds to make kind of a stone carpet. Don't know if that's a good idea, but better than wasting it. The next day I could remove the molds and tape and see the result. How cool is that? This worked amazing. Still fits. Such a unique look and the best part actually is feeling the texture. This was a great design decision. And here it is assembled. A very unique look. What I like the most is the transition at the drawers. That just turned out spot on. Now finally I want to add one more special feature that no one else has. Except for maybe this. I don't want it to be just a gimmick, but actually useful and not obvious. So hidden drawers that don't disturb the overall floating look of the bed. How would that work? Let me show you. Isn't this cool? The perfect storage for bed sheets. As I said, actually useful. As a bonus, iconically squeaking wheels and fully hidden and not obvious when there's a mattress on top. So what's going on under the mattress? The box slides in two rails that have a clicky pen type mechanism in them and a little push up disengages the rails, they tilt down and the box rolls out. When you push the slide back and push it up, the mechanism engages and holds it up. I designed everything in CAD and modern CAD software is amazing. With little effort I can simulate the whole concept and verify it's working. Well, at least in a world without friction, so my first prototype was a fail. I also built a prototype for the slide and the gas shocks. All this gets combined in one part cut out on the CNC router, where I also cut all the other necessary parts.
The assembly is the best part, as I can see everything come together. And when the real thing works like the computer simulation, that's just the best. The drawer box is a similar construction to the bedside drawers and I size them with a couple millimeters of play between the slides. Besides this just being a box, it also needs bearings on the sides to slide up the track and wheels to roll on the floor, which I just made from wood. So I made a few holes and cutouts into the box. The bearing sits with a washer on an aluminum tube in this hole. On the inside is another washer, then the wheel, another washer, and then this cover where also the other end of the aluminum tube will fit. To transfer the hole position, I used the same drill bit with a guide block, which will make a center mark. The hole is quite shallow, just enough to support the other end. And then I drill and tapped an M5 through hole, cause in the end, I will use an M5 countersink bolt to secure everything. Okay, this now is the actual first time I'm trying this. I have no idea if it works. It does. Oh my God, this is amazing. And it comes out. <laughs> I love this. Isn't this cool? Now I've added a string to prevent the slides from crashing all the way down and milled a handle shape into the box, which makes it more comfortable and smoother to use. And then I've experimented with adding gas shocks to support some of the weight and make it descend smoothly, which doesn't really work. What I would actually need are dampeners, like they're built in soft closed drawer slides, but these gas shocks were cheap enough to give it a try. All right, let's copy paste that and then it's done. Now all parts are made and I can start the finishing process, which is rounding over all corners and sanding. Everything visible to 240 grit and the rest to 120 grit. This took four full days. Ah! But it was worth it. I wiped the dust off with a tack cloth and finished everything with an oil finish. This is super simple to apply. Slap on a thick coat, the wood absorbs whatever it can and you wipe off the excess after 15 minutes. On the next day, after some light sanding, the second coat can be thinner. You then should leave the parts for two weeks while the oil cures in the wood surfaces. This leaves a nice and smooth surface that feels really nice to the touch and it also highlights some beautiful grain patterns. Finally, I glued on the corner pieces and then brought all the pieces into the bedroom. Uneventful, except for the headboard, that's bulky and weighs about 80 kilograms. For the final assembly, I put adhesive felt pads on the legs, which allow me to slide the finished bed into place. You've already seen the assembly, so nothing new here. But now I've finished up the wiring with a small electrical box on the headboard, the 12 volt power supply for the lights next to it, and a couple outlets on the sides for some hidden chargers. All right, everything is assembled. It's ready for the mattresses. But before that, I want to know if my cutouts in the light panels actually match with the outlets on the wall. And fail. <sighs> you know, this is not even a problem of measure twice, cut once. I measured this more than 10 times because I knew I should rather not screw this up. And it took me a while to figure out why this happened. 
all the measurements are correct and the dimensions of the light panels are spot on, but the total width or now height of the headboard is not as much as planned because the material just wasn't quite enough. When I cut the holes for the light panels, I seem to forgot about that and still measured from the top edge. And so everything now shifted down by about 12 millimeters, which is what's wrong here. At least it is fixable. I can shift the inner frame of the light panels up, but that means making new glass panels and back panels with all the LED strips and wiring. I will do that, but not now. Now it's time for the mattresses. The slatted frames I got used in perfect condition for a little money, actually from IKEA. The two mattresses are identical, 2 meters long, 90 centimeters wide, so a total width of 1 meter 80 centimeters. And this moment was a long time coming. What a project! I'm so happy that all the features are working and that this bed is done now. We are 40 minutes into this video and there's so much more to talk about this project. So if you're interested and want to support me at the same time, I'll host a live stream on Patreon where I watch this video, pause at certain times to give more details, more information about why, what happened and so on. And you can ask questions there, which I can answer right away. If that sounds interesting to you, there's a link in the video description and there are also links to the router bits and some other parts I used for this project. That's it. I'm gonna sleep now. Mm, sanding. Mm.